Hi all, welcome to the Material Lazy seminar series. Uh, today we are very privileged to have Professor Steve uh, Denbar from uh, UCSB, University of California, Santa Barbara. Uh, long laundry list of achievements, I don't want to go through everything. Uh, he's a distinguished professor of materials and electrical and computer engineering. He's the Mitsubishi Chemical Professor in Solid State Lighting and Display and the Director of the Solid State Lighting and Energy Electronic Center at uh, UCSB. Um, so you started or uh, founded a lot of companies too. Uh, he's a IEEE fellow. He won the Pressel Award, IEEE Photonic Society. He's a importantly elected member of the National Academy of Engineers as well as the National Academy of Inventors. Um, co-authored co more than 980 technical publications. He sent this email last month, so maybe he already has 20 more. Maybe it's thousand. No, <laughs> uh, but the most important fact is that he's a University of Arizona alum. He got his undergrad bachelor's degree in 1984. Yep. Uh, before he moved to USC to get his PhD, and he still has very fond memories. So we are very happy to have him on uh, out here giving a department seminar. And floor is yours. Thank Great. you. Thank you, Krishna, for inviting me. Sorry, it took me. Oh, well, I'll get back here. Um, but like I said, I, you know, really good uh, degree program here. Really enjoyed my time in the undergraduate. It got me really well prepared for a, a career in industry and academia. Uh, so uh, I'll just also acknowledge I have a really good group of uh, postdocs and graduate students that work with me. Along, uh, work very collaboratively with three other professors, Professor Speck, Mishra, and Nakamura on helping develop the uh, semiconductor materials that I'm going to talk about today. And of course, acknowledge the sponsorship of the uh, SSLEC uh, consortium of companies and uh, DARPA for uh, funding a lot of this research. So uh, the research at, at UCSB really is concerned with a, a, what's called the gallium nitride or three nitride semiconductor research uh, materials. And this is one of the largest centers for this specific type of semiconductor research in the world. We have over 40 uh, postdocs and students, over seven faculty, uh, that are working on that. Uh, and of course, uh, my colleague, Professor Nakamura, got the Nobel Prize for the invention of gallium nitride uh, LEDs, which are now used in, in all light bulbs uh, that are made with LEDs. Uh, he got that uh, just uh, seven years ago. Uh, and then of course, I just want to mention again, thanks to the University of Arizona, I got uh, you know some fellowships that let me get a degree in, in biological engineering at the time which then helped uh, really put me on the path towards this uh, new material of semiconductor materials and devices. So the outline I thought I'd give for today, I, I sat back and I thought, I, I thought I'd give you kind of a, a broad view of what the three nitride materials are and why we're using those for what's called advanced semiconductor materials. I'm sure you've all seen the CHIPS Act. It, it says it's gonna support silicon devices and advanced semiconductors. So under the classification of advanced semiconductors, there's a lots of different materials you can choose. Uh, one of them is, is gallium nitride, which has now become the second most dominant semiconductor after silicon devices. And I'll explain why that is. And one of those reasons we'll see is because you can make light emitting devices with this material, which is something that silicon can't do. Silicon does not emit light efficiently. Gallium nitride is the most efficient light emitter that we have, and that's let us make LED light bulbs. But I'm not going to talk about LED light bulbs today because they're already been commercialized. I thought I'd talk about the next generation of new devices that need material scientists uh, and that are going to do. And one of those is uh, what's called micro LEDs displays. Uh, there's only a few versions of this out. This isn't widely available yet, but it will be in the next generation of what's called AR augmented reality uh, glasses. And it'll be the next thing in the iWatch. Uh, we also can use things, uh, the LEDs also for things like UV uh, disinfection. So the new water treatment systems are now going away from mercury lamps. They're going to UVC uh, LEDs. Then I'll talk about uh, even more advanced applications in lasers where we use them for, for lighting. Uh, but it turns out, as you all know, the lasers are now showing up in your iPhone in the uh, facial recognition system. But they're, more importantly, we're developing them for LiDAR. LIDAR stands for light, distance, and ranging. That is to for autonomous vehicles to measure what the environment is around you so you don't collide. So for self-driving cars, 
LIDAR and LIFI will play a crucial role in communication and sensing. And then finally, I'll talk about probably one of the more interesting emerging applications, which is using the uh, semiconductor actually as the drive in your electric vehicle. This is called power switching. So currently that is in the uh, transition from silicon to silicon carbide, but lots of the power adapters are now going to gallium nitride as well. And these are the huge uh, opportunities in electric vehicles for these new semiconductors. And then finally, I'll touch a little bit on RF devices, which stands for radio frequency. So you can see one material system, we're able to basically touch three large application areas. And that's shown here kind of graphically. Uh, and these are some applications that are currently already out there. So I just thought I'd, you know, I've touched on these three areas, but just to show you what they look like. So obviously LEDs for general lighting here. This is an LED light bulb that I helped work on uh, that got commercialized. And this is uh, basically was a replacement to the last bastion of metal halide, which was these directed spotlighting. And so we're able to now cover everything from car headlights all the way to the LED lighting used in the dorms. Uh, these are still fluorescent, uh, but at my campus, the University of California has replaced all fluorescent with LED. Uh, this uh, micro LED is then just shrinking the size of the LEDs and making three colors. And if you do that and you shrink the LED, you can think of this like a football stadium you, you have here at the U of A. It's a LED screen, very big. Basically, we're taking that and we're scaling the devices by a factor of 1,000 to 10,000. If you do that, you shrink down the display to something that can fit on your eyeglass. So it's basically like putting the football stadium display and putting it in your in your uh, glasses. And this will happen. This is uh, there's all the all the major companies are working on this. Samsung was the first one to market with one. This is a consumer electronics show. This is a, a, a gallium nitride micro LED screen. It's about a 300 inch by 300 inch. Although it's not used for your eyeglasses, it uses the same technology. Uh, touch a little bit. But the lasers are strong enough now that you can use them for laser lighting displays. Uh, we actually convert the laser from a laser beam to safe light, what's called a soft light, by putting a phosphor chip in front of it. And that's what goes into your car headlights. So it's actually not a blue laser coming out of the car headlight. It's actually white light that's coming from the phosphorus, very similar to how fluorescent lamps. So there's a lot of material science in this process as well. Uh, and then finally, over here on the left, uh, the chips that are actually going into the electric vehicle are made with these so-called wide band gap semiconductors. Okay, so why, why this material system? Why did we settle on uh, the gallium nitride or what's called the three nitride material system? This means column three. So that includes gallium, aluminum, boron, indium, and now scandium nitride. And I'm only showing you the ALGAN system. And the reason this, this material system is succeeding at these extreme energy, so extreme wavelength is because it has the largest energy gap or band gap range of any semiconductor. It spans the entire visible spectrum. So that means if you take gallium nitride and you alloy it with indium nitride, uh, if you just add 20% indium to it, you get blue. You get 27%, you get green. And if you add about 35%, you get red. So just think about that. All you have to do is add indium to the crystal and you get all these colors. So it's the only semiconductor material system which spans this visible spectrum. But it also goes way up into the ultraviolet and people have now gone all the way to 220 nanometers. And this is important for um, biological, bioengineering aspects, but it also goes all the way into the infrared. So this is an important materials diagram to understand. So all you have to do is change the composition and alloy and you can, you can attain all these energies. So what is the key material science deposition technology? So believe it or not, uh, chemical vapor deposition, which relies on fluid dynamics. And I was telling Professor Poirier, I use fluid dynamics, his book, to teach how the flow of gases over this wafer develop and how we can get uniform semiconductor films. It's so uniform that nowadays we can grow on six inch wafers and we can grow 30 at a time. So the throughput for this, process is amazing. And it's done at atmospheric pressure. So you don't even need low pressure. So you can think of this as like spray painting gases at a very high temperature. And what that does is you put in the metal organic compound, which is gallium with three methyl groups, hence the metal organic version of it. And you add just ammonia gas 
and you create a material which is not found in nature. Gallium nitride is not found anywhere in nature. You have to create it, you know, with this, this process. And this is a, a non-equilibrium CBD process. So these two gases with, with hot uh, heating gives you the gallium nitride crystal, and the output is just three methane molecules. So you can see it's non-toxic. There's no toxic gases involved. Ammonia is just considered hazardous. And then this material, which we have to synthesize, is a metal organic version of the gallium metal. And so this is what the system looks like. Uh, you just literally have liquid bubblers of this metal organic. You bubble it up, and then you put in uh, the ammonia here, and you get this, this crystal out. Now, this process is so advanced now, we control it at the atomic level. That is, we can control it at three, we grow about three actions per second. So uh, a monolayer is three actions. So it has precise control now. And so this just shows you one version of just me varying the aluminum content. So if I vary the aluminum or indium content, I can get, uh, th and this is the photoluminescent spectrum, I can get wavelengths spanning the entire UV, but more importantly, I can now get red, green, and blue, all in the same reactor and all at the same time. And that's something we didn't have even, even six years ago, we didn't have the ability to do red in the same reactor as we do blue and green. So now we have all three colors. And so this is what, one of the first topic areas that, that I focus on in this lecture is tell you something that you haven't seen yet, but is gonna come in the future. And that is uh, this, this ability to make three colors of LEDs on a very small scale. Uh, and we, we've made them extremely small now. It's gonna change what you are able to see in your eyeglasses. It's gonna make your handheld phone be completely flexible. Uh, and then it'll go into your automotive. It'll go in directly into your windshield. This is a motorcycle helmet, which actually has a built-in display made with micro LEDs directly in it. And then the only one that's actually been commercialized already is, is the wall. This is a, a full screen TV, uh, which is being used in this technology. So you may say, well, we have, we have LEDs already and we have LCD and we have organic LED. Why do we need the so-called micro LED? So I, I prepared this little chart. The main reason that you're going to see micro LEDs uh, appear in the future is because they give you two things that you can't get from OLEDs. Uh, OLEDs are good for looking in displays inside, but you can't make a football stadium screen with OLEDs because it's not bright enough. So micro LEDs are 100,000, so they're literally 100 times brighter than what I can get with this watch. So you can make things 100 times brighter, but more importantly, the power consumption is 90% lower than what you can get relative to a liquid crystal. So we're looking at a liquid crystal display right now. It's consuming a lot of energy. This is probably about a 500 watt display. This would be like 50 watts if I met it with micro LED. So that becomes very important for battery life. So because of these reasons, and also the reliability's already been proven, we have all the things necessary to make a materials commercial. Lots of materials get looked at, but very few make it to the market because they don't have the uh, reliability. So because we've been working on it a long time, we now can make them very reliable. So this is everywhere you're gonna see this new uh, new device. You'll see it pretty much, I think, go to anything uh, below probably TV size, even though even though Samsung's making a TV now, you're gonna see it more in the smartphone and virtual reality, possibly even in uh, the, the headsets. And that is because we now have a way to make displays on a wafer scale process. So it's kind of like what integrated circuits did for the computer, we believe micro LEDs will do for displays. And so you'll start to see these new displays show up uh, everywhere. So we have uh, research contracts with most of the major uh, companies. So let's go back a little bit to the material science and talk about why this display will start to revolutionize, particularly mobile displays. And we look at something called quantum efficiency. So 100% quantum efficiency means you get one photon for one electron you put in. So the absolute best you could ever get is 100%. So you can see the gallium nitride material system, we're already almost 90% efficient. That means if I put in one watt of power, I'm gonna get out 0.9 watts of optical power. Uh, so this has led to the revolution in lighting. But the thing that's really starting to drive displays is, we used to have what's called a, a gap here in the green and red. And so now we have, very efficient green micro LEDs and the red are now getting above 10% efficiency. 
So this is what the micro LED display actually looks like. So if you could, you have two choices for the red, you could use a, a aluminum gallium indium phosphide or what we're doing is indium gallium nitride. And we should do that because then it lets you put them all on the same wave thread. And so if you actually blow up your cell phone, you will look at it under a microscope, you will see three pixels that look just like this for every, every color. And so these pixels are currently about 100 to 40 microns across. We're gonna shrink that down to 10 microns. So you'll have in this size, we'll be able to fit basically 100 times higher resolution with the micro LEDs. And that's what you need to make uh, your things. Now that external quantum efficiency, uh, oops, there we go. Let's see if I can pull that back up. We asked Chucky, how do I get rid of that? Oh, I got it. <laughs> Thank you. Here, I don't know how to hide it. No, I'm sorry. I think you can just. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> sorry. So this is external quantum efficiency. So the big problem we faced is that when you make these materials smaller, the efficiency dropped very quickly. So we didn't know why. Uh, and this was a problem we had solved. So I said we had 90% efficient LEDs, but look what happens when you make them in the red. You're down to 6% or even less. So uh, this is a problem we had about 15 years ago. And it was even as recently as four years ago, we were only around 12%. So what we, we did was we introduced indium into the crystal and that helped solve a lot of this efficiency drop because uh, so a normalized efficiency of one also means 100%. So it turns out if you add indium to uh, a gallium nitride and here's gallium nitride. So what happened is as you increase the number of defects up to about a million defects per square centimeter, the efficiency would drop from 100 down to uh, less than 10%. So it turned out if we added indium, which we needed to do anyways to get the color, suddenly the crystal became bright. And this is actually one of the things that Dr. Nakamura got the Nobel Prize for. Because he explained why would adding indium to a crystal make it immediately so bright, and particularly when you have so many defects. And the reason turned out to be uh, quantum localization. Now, this, is, this was something nobody had ever really seen before in line emitting devices. But when you add indium to gall gallium nitride, you don't get a uniform alloy. So a lot of people thought that was bad. It's actually a good thing. So you get uh, an alloy which looks like this. And this is an atom probe measuring you from the top. So if we made a quantum well, you would get huge fluctuations in the indium. What that does in the energy gap state is you would get a very kind of like a uh, very rough surface. So normally semiconductor scientists would tell you, you don't want to get a rough surface, but it turned out to be the exact opposite. You actually want an alloy because the alloy would then provide a, a what's called a, a, a quantum well here, or even a localized quantum state. This isn't just a quantum well, this is localization in all three dimensions. So this is what's called nanotechnology. It's basically a quantum box. So you get a quantum box here in this little region. So when you throw electron holes in from the battery, rather than go anywhere, they go, they fall into this well. And this is just like uh, freshman quantum mechanics when you solve for the finite potential well. We have now created a finite potential well. So the electron hole recombine here, and that keeps them away from the defects in the crystal. So this was, uh, you know, I, uh, even my, the, my colleague who got the Nobel Prize says, they didn't know this was happening. This was all found out after the fact. So he made the device very bright first and it took us about 10 years to figure out why it was bright. So Nobel prizes, you know, there was no computational material science to figure this out. This was done where he's just in the lab making things and suddenly he adds indium and all of a sudden it gets bright. And uh, so this was that paper in nature that, that helped uh, really set them apart from, from everybody else. So indium is the only material you can, you know. No, so now other people have found out you could do things like with aluminum, but you've got to grow it under conditions where you get uh, aluminum gallium nitride, where you get some uh, localization. And another thing people do in, in telecommunication devices I worked on is, but it's indium, they make a, a quantum dots. So you get a surface that's not wetted and the indium will fall up. And so then you cover that up and you get a, what's called a quantum ball or a quantum box. So that's also used in telecommunication devices. It's called a quantum dot laser. So this is now being used not only in the nitride, but also in the uh, indium phosphide materials. Okay, uh, we're a little bit slow here. Uh, anyway, so 
where we were, uh, you know, uh, about five years ago is as we tried to reduce the size from 100 micron, and I said we need a 10 micron to make these micro LED displays, is we couldn't get any light out of the 10 micron uh, device. And so this just shows you the improved materials process. We're now able to get very bright 10 micron. And I thought I'd talk a little bit about how we solved that. And uh, what we did to solve that is we developed a process to passivate the sidewalls. So the problem was that the efficiency dropped as we made the device smaller. And what we determined is when you get it so small, you create defects when you etch it on the sidewall. So now we've gone from a low defect density to a small defect. You have a surface really close to the device. And so what we did is we employed another technique in chemical vapor deposition, and this is called uh, ALD or atomic layer deposition. So as you refurb your clean room here, you should buy a couple ALD machines because this is a now control of the chemical vapor deposition process at the atomic level. And it's a modification of MOCBD where we, instead of reacting uh, ammonia with the metal organic, we react water. And so you, you act trimethyl aluminum with water. And in particular, you pulse these in separately. And what you get is you get a perfect uh, aluminum oxide on the on that device. So ALD is a very important tool, not just for galvanic, but all silicon processing now uses this 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 chemical reaction or version of this chemical reaction. So you could see my career is basically involved in material science, but also chemical engineering, and then then we do the electrical engineering on the on this structure. And what we found out, aluminum oxide uh, gave us the best passivation. We'll see how it affects the devices. And it also lets us now get to all three colors of red, green, and blue. So here's the problem is when you go from the uh, 100 micron to 10, efficiency drop from 25 to less than 15. And so this is the problem we're trying to solve. So this is what the sidewall of our device looks like. So this is a semiconductor wafer and you, you, you make a PN junction. So here's the P-type material, here's the N-type material. So you need two electrodes, you need a, a, a top a cathode and you need a, an anode, so it looks like this. So one probe's here and one probe's here. And what happens is when I made this MESA, I created a huge number of defects. But what I just told you is, is if you use an ALD, you can have very high quality sidewall and passivate those defects. So we put it on each side. And then this uh, quantum well region where I added the indium, this is where all the light comes from. So these are each quantum oil, by the way, is only uh, uh, three nanometers. So that's 30 angstroms. So we do six of those here, and this is our lighter medium. And so, like I said, this was the reference process. This is the process used in industry to make light bulbs. So it doesn't work for 10 microns or 20 microns. This is uh, plasma enhanced CBD. This is the normal way silicon vaps put down CBD. Uh, and then this is the approved way to deposit silicon dioxide. This is atomic layer deposition. And you can see it's not only brighter, uh, but even the small ones light up. And so uh, this was, we, we only did this uh, six years ago. So this, this helped solve it. And then this is some device characteristics. So what we saw with the ALD is that we got no leakage current. This is a high leakage current here. This is uh, as you make the device smaller here. This high leakage current is unacceptable. It means you have a lot of defect recombination. Uh, particularly around 20 microns, we've almost completely solved it. And this shows you again, so this was a 100 micron device. This was its efficiency versus current. Uh, it's not too affected by the sidewalls, but the small devices completely affected. The blue would have been the standard process, but you can see the uh, atomic layer deposition here. So that means we have now 32% efficiency, which is much, much better than an LCD screen. This current TV you're looking at is 3% efficient. So we're already 10 times more efficient than this TV screen. Uh, we improved it even further. So now we're at 42%. So OLEDs are about 5%. So we're actually even 10 times more efficient than the, the o OLED blue LED. So this is why most of the uh, display companies and even some of the media companies like uh, Facebook, Google, Apple are all working on a new display technology. Because this will, this will revolutionize make displays that can run off solar cells. You may not even need a battery anymore because the efficiency is, is so good. And, and they're extremely bright. The way you see that is uh, most TVs run at around about 30 amp per square centimeter, which is here, but uh, football stadiums run around hundred. So right about here, we can actually drive these things about six times higher and still maintain efficiency. So they'll be extremely uh, bright and efficient at almost all curves.
Quick clarification, uh, if possible. What was the application? Um, quick clarification question, if possible. Yeah, sure. Um, in the previous slide, you mentioned these micron sizes. Are we talking about the lateral sizes or the thicknesses? The lateral size. Okay. And how about the thickness? Are these all fixed thicknesses? Are there any thickness dependence on the quantum efficiency? Yeah, there is a thickness dependence on the quantum. So they, these are, like I said, they're 10 micron by 10 micron. We've actually made them one by one, and the height mm -hmm. is half a micron. But the thickness dependency is in the quantum well. It's 30 angstroms thick. I see. And that's what you get from the layered process. Very good. Okay. Very clear. Thank you. So, so very small now in the lateral dimensions. But 10 by 10, honestly, 10 by 10 microns is good enough for most display applications. Okay, uh, so I mentioned there was one other problem we had to solve, and that is to get red on the same wafer. Uh, so in the red, believe it or not, the only thing we had to change was change the quantum well material from blue and green to red. So that means putting more indium in. But we also had to add a, a very high aluminum cap on top of that to keep the indium inside from diffusing out. Uh, so we did a slight change there in the, uh, this is called the epitaxial layer stack. And this is all grown within, it takes about only two hours to grow this entire stack, but it takes a month to fabricate the device. So the fab's hard, the, the stack is actually the easy part though. Uh, so we, we, we have done that now, uh, but its efficiency is uh, still not good enough. It's two and a half percent EQE. We'd like this to be around five to 6% before we could really talk about uh, high efficiency RGB displays. Right now, the green, blue and the green are very high. The red needs, needs a lot of work. So that's our current research focus is trying to figure out why the efficiency drops so fast as we go to the red. All other characteristics are good. The wavelength looks good in the red. The voltage is good. So three volts means it's easy to drive from, uh, in your iPhone, there's a five volt power source. So it's easy to drive and uh, power is good. But the, uh, the wavelength shift is a little bit big. So we'd like to fix that wavelength at a fixed current and then probably do uh, pulse width modulation around here. And you may ask how you can, uh, how you make these displays. This is uh, one way people are doing it. They're doing a, uh, a laser liftoff release. So they, they grow actually a green wafer, a red and a blue. And then they just do a transfer print of, uh, of the LEDs using, uh, using polymer stamps. So I'll show you one version of that. Uh, so one way we do a, a release is we use a, it's called a photoelectric chemical etch. So we grow the LED stack and we put an interface material, which can be etched off. And we put that below the micro LED uh, and we, we mount the LED to a stamp. So what we do is we grow the whole structure. Uh, we then fabricate rows of these LEDs on a releasable structure. A PEC etch needs blue light. So that's, that's the uh, photo. So blue light generates electron hole pairs only in the sacrificial layer, and it's then etched off. And so uh, this just shows your stamp. So I'll show you what this looks like. So this is what it looks like from the top. This is the side view. Uh, this is what it looks like. So you literally just attach this uh, PDMS stamp to the top of your device. And after you etch it, it pulls off all these micro LEDs. And then you take this stamp and you can stamp it on any kind of display you want. So this is the mass transfer approach. Uh, you can see yields not not hundred percent. We had a, a yield loss here. So a lot of companies are struggling. They you need for a display you need uh, basically only one ppm of failure or a way to repair that. So we've got to get our yields a little bit better. So there's still issues with this, the release process, but nevertheless we can stamp that on on a piece of glass. So that's what we did. So we just took a glass slide and we stamped an array of, of LEDs there. So these LEDs are very robust. You can transfer them onto your eyeglasses. Some people want to do medical devices. Uh, so a lot of material science hidden in passive. Good question. Yeah. Those release issues are caused by the sacrificial layer, not... Exactly. It's caused by we weren't getting complete etch of the sacrificial layer. So we need a better release technology. Some people are looking at like putting a boron nitride layer there, which is 2D, and that might lift off better. Uh, some people use laser lift off. So they blast it, uh, but that damages the LED. So th there's still issues how to get your semiconductor away from the substrate. Got it. That's good. But nevertheless, 
we now have a now flexible uh, LED platform. You can see we did put out a piece of plexiglass here, and then we uh, actually probed all three colors. So we transferred three colors on here. Uh, so we haven't made a full TV yet because that that's not that's for the companies to do, not for graduate students. But nevertheless, this was one of the first demonstrations of all three colors. Okay, so that was just one application. I got two more to go. Uh, so the other new application is. So you guys know all about LED light bulbs, but you probably didn't realize you can use a laser to make a, a laser light bulb. So this is a, one of the first demonstrations of a laser light bulb. So the big advantage, why, why would you want to use a laser for a light bulb? So it turns out, uh, so this is the third generation of lighting. So you can already buy a laser light bulb if you buy a, a, a high-end German car. It turns out Audi and BMW, where the headlights are using a laser light source. So what? Why would you want to do this? Turns out LEDs efficiency, I told you, is great at low currents, but as you go above a kiloamp, it turns out the efficiency actually they don't work so well. Turns out lasers work great at high currents. So at the very high currents, you get a lot of light out. So a laser light bulb requires one teeny chip. So this is as big as a grain of sand. So it's about 0.3 by 0.3. So it replaces uh 11 millimeters of bumping material. That means it, it, it's 33 times smaller than an LED. But why would you want to have a, a, just a single device? It turns out for headlights and directed lighting, and uh, you can actually buy laser projectors now, it's directional emission. You get complete control of just putting a lens over a point source. It's the perfect optical source. So uh, if you may recall, the very first cinema projectors had very big lenses on the output. Of them. Still, they do. Laser projectors, uh, we don't have one here in this room, but you can buy them online now. Use uh, basically gallium nitride lasers combined with red, green, blue phosphors for the projection display. But it's the same for the headlight. You basically get very good uh, efficiency and you get really good emission. Uh, so this just shows you from a single chip, this is one teeny chip. We're usually we can get a couple tens of milliwatts from an LED, from a laser, you can get two watts. So two watts is enough to do an entire light bulb from one piece. And so it's really not going to go into lighting everywhere, but it's going to go to lighting where you need a lot of directionality of the light source. So automotive landing uh, sources will probably start to appear uh, because you could actually extend the light source to about a kilometer. So when your plane currently comes in, they turn on the headlights of the plane. It can't see the runway until you're almost there. This source, you can see it about one kilometer away. And so it's a very directed source of lighting. You can even buy laser uh, flashlights online now. So they're coming. We had, we had to do a lot of work to make them safe. And you may go, how, how could this possibly be safe? And I'll just show you what. It's because every uh, laser light bulb you put, sorry, I'm trying to use the mouse here. You put uh, basically on the top of it, uh, you put a, you basically adhesive phosphor crystal on it. And the phosphor converts all laser light back into white light. So it's really a two-step process. You generate blue light with a laser, but then you generate white light with the phosphors. Okay, uh, another application for, for gallium nitride is what's called a distributed feedback laser. So in the same crystal, you use chemical uh, etching to etch a grating. So this, this is now gonna, this grating, it's the same way when you look at a compact disc, you see a reflection, a rainbow of reflections. And this one is you put those gratings on the top of the laser and the mirror then becomes this grating. And so it's a grating, basically a grating laser. And so rather than get LED emission everywhere, you only get lasing in the, uh, in the uh, perpendicular plane to this grating and we get what's called a distributed feedback. So it's a little more complicated than an LED or say a lot more complicated, but the fabrication doesn't take that much longer. And this is what it, the chip looks like. So a laser is, is more long. So you have a long chip. This is stands for microns. So this is a 1500 microns by eight microns wide. So this is what a semiconductor laser looks like. You guys we used to use laser pointers in the red. They pretty much look like this. This one's just in the blue. The only difference is we now put a grating on the top and this is what the fine grating looks like. And what that grating does, it gives you a very single wavelength of emission. So this is, this is a side mode suppression ratio of about 24 dB here. We have single wavelength coming out and you can temperature tune it and uh, you can use it for uh, a very narrow spectrum range. So what would use these lasers? 
would be uh, the LIDAR application I mentioned. So light distance and ranging. So now you have a single wavelength. It's very easy to measure precisely how far away a car is. In fact, you get it down to about a, less than a millimeter in some of these systems. So current radar systems, you don't know the car distance within a, about a foot, but this thing is gonna do a millimeter. So probably over a million. So anyway, so we see the, the new type of lasers ending up in the car headlights. They can also do straight uh, communication to your cell phone uh, using free space communication. But I really think the big application that people are worried is really for the, the collision avoidance is LIDAR. So that will be the light source, uh, one of the light sources for LIDAR. Okay, in the last 15 minutes, because I want to leave room for questions, I thought I'd talk about uh, using the material for electronics and power switching. So what are these fields? So it turns out the same material I use for LEDs, if I add aluminum to it, I go up the band gap chain. So now I'm, I'm higher energy. It's, these devices you make, instead of a, a, a light emitting diode, which is two terminal, I add a third terminal, which is called a gate. And I can now make devices which uh, are used in uh, radio frequency communication. So it turns out 5G base stations already are employing the, this material, aluminum gallium nitride, for the base, base station. So this communicates at very high data rates. But power switching, it's basically reducing the size of your adapter. So uh, I have an adapter here. This, this adapter is uh, basically uh, for my computer now. This is now made with gallium nitride. The, the one that you get from Apple is about twice that big or three times that big. And that's because they use a, a silicon device instead of a gallium nitride device. So switching to this new semiconductor lets you do two things. Reduce the size by a factor of 10, but this, this device is 98% efficient. So this thing isn't even hot. I had it plugged into the wall. If it was a silicon-based device, you grab your adapter, it's very hot. So, so we see now an, another emerging field for semiconductors in, uh, these event is, is all the way from radio frequency devices. So medium power, which is my adapter here, power supply. Uh, eventually, we believe this stuff will even go into uh, rail traction, motor drive, electric vehicles. This will take decades of material science to get into these higher applications. If we have to drive, right now we're at about 1,000 volts. These applications take 10,000 volts, but it will get there. Already in Japan, they have a couple trains working with silicon carbide semiconductors. So same reason why electric vehicles, which use semiconductors, are so efficient. You get such good conversion of AC power to DC or vice versa, on the order of 98%. So you only have about 2% energy loss or heating. Silicon can't do that. And so that's why we see a, a bright future here as well from power electronics. So got to go back to some basic materials properties that I learned here at UC, uh, at U of A and, and, and at USC. And that is something of, uh, called mobility and band gap. And silicon has a band gap of 1.1. So that's the, the forbidden gap. But that inherently gives it a very low breakdown field or what's called critical breakdown field. So E critical is the, the voltage at which silicon breaks down. And you can see it breaks down at about 0.3 megavolt per centimeter. If I add aluminum to gallium nitride, let's look at this. It breaks down 33 times higher, 11 volts per centimeter. Silicon carbide is three. So silicon carbide is three times higher breakdown rate. And it's Oops, fundamentally caused by this band gap. So as you go up in band gap energy, the breakdown field strength increases. Now, what we didn't have 30 years ago is all three of these boxes where it says mobility, which is how easy mobile electrons are in these materials. These were all much less than silicon. These were like 50, 10, 100. So using material science, primarily chemical vapor deposition, these are now all very good mobilities of 700, 900. This one's now 1100. So so we don't have to suffer anymore about mobility anymore. And now with the increased breakdown field strength, we can make these devices. But even more importantly is uh, we can add a lot of electrons with what's called a, a heterojunction technology, which was another Nobel Prize in 2000. Uh, there was a Nobel Prize awarded for the heterojunction. And what the heterojunction gives us is the ability to combine gallium nitride with aluminum gallium nitride. And that gives us huge charge on the order of 100 times more charge in silicon. So now we have the same mobility, much higher voltage, but we, we have very high charge and that gives us low specific odd resistance. So this is, I showed you an LED cross section. 
this is a, a, a hemp's cross structure, what's called a high electron mobility. So this was the standard hemp that we were making. We now make what's called a field plated hemp. And all as it is, is gallium nitride channel with aluminum gallium nitride on top, and then the three contacts, source gate and drain metallization. So here's the thicknesses and dimensions of everything. So gate length of about 0.7 microns, which is the gate length here. Uh, then we do a, a wide, 150 micron wide device. And then we put on some like a nitride passivation. We haven't replaced this yet with ALD, although I want to do that soon. And then the metallization, the metallurgy is, is titanium aluminum contacts for omic, indicates nickel gold. So this is a very powerful device. The part I do is I do the, the, the epitaxy, which is called the chemical vapor deposition. So this is what it looks like. Uh, this is uh, going in the cross section of the device. So I get a silicon carbide substrate, which are now up to six inch. And then I put on uh, undoped to stands for unintentionally doped gallium nitride. I put a very thin aluminum nitride layer on top of that. We'll see why that is later. And then I go back to Algan. So this is, this is a transistor structure. You guys probably learned silicon CMOS. So in that structure, it's, it's uh, typically silicon plus silicon dioxide. This is a replacing the silicon silicon dioxide structure. A lot of material science in here, believe it or not. Um, it take, took us decades to get this thing right. Uh, do a lot of weird nucleation steps basically and get it smooth. This is different than the LED. This one would want smooth. So this is atomic forest microscope. So each wave here is an atomic step. So you can see this is looks like it's called step flow mode growth. So this is a atomically smooth epitax. So in this case, we want very smooth because we want to get a very high electron mobility on it. And that's because when you look at the electron scattering mechanism here, this is total mobility versus the charge, you have to really worry about interface roughness, which is the smoothness. But it turns out you also have to worry about alloy roughness. So it's the almost the exact opposite story of the LED where I told you we wanted a really rough alloy. For the transistor market, you want a very smooth alloy. And that brings us to why we, we went, we're going to add aluminum nitride. So we had to get rid of alloy disorder. And so the way you get rid of alloy disorder is you switch from an aluminum gallium nitride gallium nitride interface to an aluminum nitride gallium nitride interface because there's no alloy here. It's, they're both binary. And that gives you a much, uh, much, much higher sheet charge. So in red here is the aluminum nitride GAN. So this is a probability where you find the electron versus distance. This, it's a little hard to see here. There's a kind of a triangular thing here. This is a triangular potential well. So this is the actual probability of finding an electron. And so uh, the, the probability you find the electron in the channel is very high. I'm going to skip this one because this is a little, well, maybe not. This is the energy band diagram. Uh, this is where we start doing some electrons. This shows you when adding the thin aluminum nitride does. It basically gives you a very high conduction band. gives you a very high potential well here to trap the charge uh, versus the standard material, which was algae. So believe it or not, until we added this, this very thin aluminum nitride layer, this material was not competitive enough for the, uh, for the cell phone market. Just adding a couple nanometers of aluminum nitride made this material system then commercially relevant for the cell phone market. So now a lot of the uh, cell phone base stations you see around town are using uh, a hemp with aluminum nitride in it. So it, it just shows you the importance of material science. It took us a long time to get there, but we eventually got there. Uh, these are some charts which cell phone makers like to look at, which is power out versus power in. And they look at how much power you get per millimeter of material. All you need to know is that uh, you get out eight watts per millimeter. So your cell phone uses about 0.6 watts. So you only need uh, one tenth of this material. You need one tenth of a millimeter of a chip to get, make a transistor for a cell phone. But that's not its main application. This main application is for the, the cell phone tower. And this is why. So this is a function of power density at radio frequency versus year. This is where gallium arsenide was back in 98 when we start. So we started this materials research in 1998. Uh, and we were told you're not gonna beat silicon carbide. So the carbon carbide is still at four watts. So you can see right around the year 2000, 2013, we're now at 18 watts per millimeter. So that is much, much better power density than what you can get with gallium arsenide and silicon. Silicon, by the way, is less than a watt per millimeter still. So 
that's why uh, gallium nitride became a relevant material for the uh, radio frequency market. And so this is kind of where we are today for power devices. The Algan material system is, is leading into huge size reduction. This is a Los Angeles based company doing uh, efficient power converters with the gallium nitride. But it, it all goes back to the fundamental material property of this material system having such a large band gap. And now by adding the aluminum nitride, we're able to get mobilities around 2000. Oops, this one didn't transfer very well, but she shows you all the materials being developed at UCSB. So this is something called on resistance, how resistant the semiconductor is to breakdown voltage. Uh, and you can see we've been moving away from silicate for some time. Um, Wolf Speed is a company in North Carolina that we worked with a long time ago. They are now the world leader in silica carbide technology here in blue. So this is what goes into all the Tesla, all the all electric vehicles are now switching Volkswagen, Audi, they're all using silicon carbide uh, for the actual drivetrain in your electric vehicle. So if anybody has a Tesla, you're using silicon carbide, you just didn't know it yet. And then all the uh, power adapters are switching to gallium nitride. It's gonna take a couple of years, believe it or not, for us to get the aluminum nitride materials in there, but eventually you probably will because you wanna be, the best place to be on this curve is down into the right. So you can see diamond is a new material we're looking at. Diamond would be the ultimate semiconductor, but I've been saying that for 40 years. So we still have a lot of work to do to get diamond CBD work. But these are all the materials. And then we just hired a, a new professor, Sri Ram Krishnamurti, to do gallium oxide. So there's all this new materials being discovered. Uh, just 10 years ago, there were, gallium oxide wasn't on this chart, and aluminum nitride wasn't on this chart 10 years ago. So always looking for new materials. And that, that's, that's been the story of semiconductors. Uh, maybe skip this one just because I want to leave enough room for question. But power switching is. A huge energy loss. Basically, all electricity in the US goes through power conversion, and it's about 10% of our energy loss right now. Uh, so I think I'll switch there and just conclude. Um, some conclusion I, I hope I give you guys some feel for the kind of uh, material science of chemical vapor deposition and atomic vapor deposition. Showed you what uh, these new kind of advanced semiconductor materials that you probably didn't know are, are going into cell phones and uh, things like LiDAR systems. And eventually, hopefully, uh, materials for advanced uh, RF and power devices. So, thanks for inviting me, and uh, we'll take questions. Yeah, thanks, Steve. Uh, we'll yeah. of, I think yeah. it's first question. Yes. Can you make them your way into solar panel? It turns out the, uh, the gallium nitride is used as the inverter for the solar panel. So when we take in the sunlight, you got to go AC, so DC to AC. So it chooses the converter, but it's not being used as the solar material yet. And that's because it's still silicon. It's still silicon. And then the perovskites, perovskites are starting to look really attractive and gallium arsenide. A lot of people don't know this, all satellites don't use silicon. All the satellites are gallium arsenide based solar cells. It turns out that the gallium nitride is too wide of a band gap. So most of the sunlight spectrum we're too wide. So sunlight goes right through gallium nitride wafer. The wafer looks just like a glass when you look through it. So the problem with gallium nitride, it's letting the sunlight go through it. So, so do you think the solar panels that we see people's roofs mm -hmm. is going to remain to be silicon for a long time? I think it will be silicon, but it, some of the alloys with silicon, like silicon carbide or silicon germanium starting to alloy in there. And then uh, some of the new materials, there's some organic solar cell materials should be coat on it. But man, silicon's hard to beat on that one. And silicon has the cost advantage, huge reactors, huge scale. Silicon's about 20%. Best case, silicon can get to maybe 30%. But satellites are 50% efficiency now. And that's gallium arsenide. So I don't know if we'll get the cost of gallium arsenide for these big panels down to compete with silicon. So it's going to take still some ingenious material science, I think. Okay. Silicon. Thank you. Yeah. Any of the Zoom folks, you guys have any questions? Sorry, I can't see the chat. Krishna, can you hear me? Yeah, he can hear you. Hi, Steve. Thanks for a fantastic lecture. Um, my question is about silicon carbide substrates. Um, I see this that three word, three letters CMP, which got me excited. <laughs> what I used to work on. 
So I know the surface of uh, CMP, uh, silicon carbide substrates, as this polished, it's a lot of defects. Yeah. So do you grow uh, epi silicon carbide layer on it before you build your devices or just as polished or as, uh, as clean substrates? That's a good question, Trini. We actually do a, a, an epitaxial step, but not growing silicon carbide on it. We actually grow a, an aluminum gallium nitride layer. We anneal it first under hydrogen. So we kind of etch it and then we put down, uh, some people put down aluminum nitride layer first and then we do a, a, a aluminum gallium nitride layer. But we have to spend some time to smooth that layer down. Uh, uh, Wolf Speed, however, does do epi silicon carbide on some of their wafers that they ship out. So they, after CMP, they will put epitaxy on it. Okay, thank you so much, Steve. I think a couple of them have raised their hands. Right? Yeah, they, they raised their hand, but they're not in the meeting. Yeah, we can see you. So I have a question. Hi, everybody. Hey, Bruno. Okay, hey, how are you, Krishna? Thank you, Professor Dunbars, for a wonderful talk. Um, I, I'm from the uh, coming from the lens of nano manufacturing. Um, I feel like there's a lot of uh, you already told some some beautiful tales of how nano manufacturing made a difference, whether it's roughness, the strain, uh, engineering, and other uh, inputs in the manufacturing process that deliver these types of things. Could you like elaborate what are some of the maybe like surprises or you know where processes were really optimized? I think there's a lot of trade secrets in this area. We don't know really what was the holy grail in the nano manufacturing process, whether it's FT taxi or transfer printing. What, what do you think were some of the breakthroughs in terms of enabling uh, uh, the performance? Yeah, uh, let me see if I can get back to um, think. So, so one of the breakthroughs was was determining. Um, so I can go back up. Uh, yeah, one of the breakthroughs was literally figuring out that you had to put down a very thin layer of aluminum nitride. If you did more than a nanometer, you exceeded the critical strain and the layer would crack. So you had we had to figure out a way to get aluminum nitride to wet gallium nitride uh, and get a, a basically, this is 10 nanometers is three, three monolayers, so three atomic layers. So rather, uh, basically it was in the chemical vapor deposition process to figure out the uh, correct ratio of aluminum to ammonia for that to happen. And uh, that was a key breakthrough because if you just try to grow it without knowing what was going on at the atomic level, and we determined this post growth with atomic force microscope, how to get that atomically flat. Kind of goes back to Srini's question about how do you, how did you, you know, you, not only do you have to get the silicon carbide, this part has to be uh, chemically mechanically polished, but then again on top of it, and I'm not showing it here for patent reasons, was there's an algan layer here, which we use to smooth it. But that that's one. Uh, another one was put back all the way to the, uh, to the gallium nitride was it's complete opposite story with the LEDs where you want to actually force the uh, alloy to segregate. So yeah, this one. So I actually want to look the alloy to look like this. So we actually force the chemical vapor deposition process and use temperatures, which makes the indium gallium nitride want to go into spinodal decomposition. So if you don't, and that's a pretty narrow temperature range. So if you don't get it to, uh, to phase separate into high and low composition, it would not work as, the brightness would be down by factors of 10. So this is something, and this came out in the literature, uh, whereas the, the transistor stuff still, there's a lot of know-how that pre-corporation doesn't publish. That I yeah I don't even know but this these are two areas in nano manufacturing I think where it took a you know this looks easy now but it took us uh, five seven years to figure this out. Thank you, Professor Dunbar. Um, Steve, if you can click on the chat, I think there's maybe one more question. Uh, okay. Oh, there is now. Oh. I will need to drop off. Thank you. Okay. Another meeting. <laughs> okay. We're almost at twelve. Yeah, Sammy. So I just want to thank you for giving a truly inspiring talk that couples material science, manufacturing, as well as, you know, design and engineering of device structures. I think, you know, this is truly insightful for a lot of the students. But getting back to, you know, the ability to identify new material systems, is that still largely done 
empirically in the lab, or is there more computational no, I'm sorry, methods I'm sorry. now yeah, we, coming we, online to yeah, help with that? Back up a little bit. So, so I think computational science, material science, starting to make an impact. I'll just mention one material, and we'll go back to it. Uh, one of our professors, uh, I can't get them, uh, Vanderwall does computational material science. So he has been predicting some new materials to look at that, that are starting to work. Uh, one of those is scandium nitride. We didn't think to look at that. Scandium nitride. Yeah, so scandium nitride, you know, it's way over on the yeah, left. Scandium yeah, is yeah, group three. Yeah, yeah. So we didn't think it'd be a semiconductor. So he predicted it'd be a semiconductor, and, and he did. So now we have another alloy to add to our aluminum, gallium, scandium nitride, uh, which we could do for maybe ultraviolet devices. So that, that kind of came out of material science. Uh, then boron nitride is a whole host of stuff because boron's a group three. Right, right. And now we have, so now I have like five elements on the left side. So if you do the, it's factorial. So we have like a couple hundred, a couple thousand different alloys. To right, right, right. So, so computational material science is helping us there on these kind of new materials, but still the, the reduction to practice, I'd say is still empirical. I, I tend to be very, I'm really an experimentalist, but very much leaning towards the applications. And I, yeah, so the stuff I'm showing you, this is a couple of decades, two decades of work. Uh, so it looks easy now. And it's a lot of what I talk about now is hindsight, but I, I don't tell you about all the problems, failures. all the dead ends. There's a lot of failures in there, you know. But there's a lot more to be discovered. Yeah, so, so going forward. Yeah, just, I think the alloys with silicon, like silicon carbide, nobody thought that would go anywhere 30 years ago. And now, you know, there's these big factories going in upstate New York that are silicon carbide factories. Um, yeah, and so we can do silicon germanium, we do silicon carbide germanium, and then diamonds. Right, right, carbon. right. Diamond, diamond and then you have material. all, yeah. you have graphene, you have graphite, you have all the new forms of carbon you can do. So I'm still waiting for a two-dimensional carbon transistor to be married with silicon. Mm -hmm. Lots of, lots of still yeah. material science. Uh, to be done, <laughs> we'll just say. Diamond, you say the best? Diamond's the best. Is it in terms of thin film or? Well, it's got the best thermal conductivity. It's got the largest band gap and it's got high mobility. The only problem with diamond, we haven't found a good N-type doping. We have good P-type doping to diamond. We don't have a good N-type, so we can't make PNP, uh, can't make a header, can't make bipolar transistors yet. But the, ASU, uh, Bob Demovich, I'm not, I mean, he's not online, but uh, ASU has a big effort on diamond. Yes. Big, uh, uh, I guess, NSF Center on diamond. Uh, but they're they're stuck with the CBD. I hate to say this to Bob. I could show you six inch wafers. He's still showing me, you know, a couple millimeter diamond transistors. So they need a better materials deposition technology for diamond. You know, you can't, that's why you can't, nobody, you can actually grow diamond on diamond crystals and some, Companies started to do that, and then they got quickly bought up by De Beers. But nobody's come up with a good diamond deposition process. That's that's limiting it. Even graphene, I, I've still yet to see you know big sheets of graphene. I keep hearing you guys do these sheets, but everybody's getting like you know millimeter type flakes, right? So we we need to determine that a better materials deposition technology for graphene and diamond for sure, and bar nitride. Any questions? Yeah. Uh, so if we go back one slide. Uh, I can't figure out how to close these things. Turkey, I, I think that right there. Try going to more on the top right. Click that more icon. Yeah. And that gives you what is this? Height, floating. It was going back and forward on here. But there it goes. Fine. This one? Or uh, other direction? Uh, yeah, never mind. I like well, uh, yeah, like actually, like, yeah, that, that's that's right. Uh, so, like, as far as I understand, the gallium arsenide has a much higher quantum efficiency for red light, right? In the red, yeah. So, that means here's gallium arsenide. So, what they have, they have substrates that tend to the third. Okay. But gallium arsenide, this kept gallium arsenide uh, back in the field. They are only efficient if you get less than a thousand defects per centimeter. Oh, okay. So, they have what's called bulk gallium arsenide. Well, like, I mean, like, uh, what, like, why is that this is, uh, for the uh, red wave in gallium nitride? Uh, if, if, like, instead of gallium arsenide, like, so, yeah, the reason we're using gal is because when you make this material small, it's not efficient. Okay, okay. So, this one, so uh, let me just point out the reason we have six inches is because we're growing gallium nitride on sapphire. Ah, okay. You can buy sheets of sapphire. In fact, when you go to the grocery store, 
that checkout glass, that's not glass, that's a sapphire, wait, single crystal thing, because it's got a scratch. So we can grow gallium nitride single crystal on that. That gave us, so, so we have a billion defects per square centimeter, but we're still able to get 80, 90% efficiency. That's kind of one of the surprising things I think somebody asked. Nobody would have thought you could get devices on Sapphire work. I have, I mean, uh, you showed that the efficiency of the red compared to the blue and green were much lower. Yes. Uh, is that an open question? Is, is it size dependent just because of the wavelength of red? It's, it's an open question. We think it's because of this effect that as you etch it, you get a lot of defects on the surface. So, uh, and that just gallium arsenide is more susceptible to defects because of something called surface recombination. So they haven't solved, they haven't found a material to add to gallium arsenide to make it do this. You had in, in GAN, indium to it, it helps a little bit, but you know, not much. Okay. So there, there could be a new material that comes along that suddenly makes gallium arsenide very efficient in the red and the green. But right now, the fundamental reason it drops is the band structure, what's called the band gap of, of, of gallium arsenide as you go to the green, goes from direct to indirect. So it becomes like a silicon yeah. device. It doesn't emit light anymore. So there's a fundamental reason why gallium arsenide can't be used for blue or green. And this is just a, not a science question, but is uh, are we moving away from LIDAR because Tesla seems to be suggesting that they're, yeah. they're focusing on image processing. Yeah, yeah, they're going to just do it all with Kim. Yeah. Yeah. So is that happen or? Uh, they have Tesla techniques? is the only car company that doesn't have LIDAR on its roadmap. Yeah. Because, yeah, Elon thinks it's too expensive. Oh. And you need to be careful when driving. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, so the main thing is the LIDAR. So here's, it, it, the premise is that you drive right now with just your eyesight. So yeah. Tesla's just going to run. The thing that LIDAR gives you is uh, the extra safety at night. So, for instance, uh, our LIDAR system that BMW and those guys, they, it can see a person in the road at 600 meters. Yeah. You can't see them. At yeah. the so it's going to be much safer at night, especially if you have all these autonomous vehicles going over. But I do think it's probably going to remain an option on the cars for some time. And at some point, they may or may not regulate that LiDAR. I don't, I'm not sure you'll get the full self-driving on a Tesla with just, just the cameras. Okay. You know, it's a lot of, might, but. Yeah. I have a Tesla and uh, I don't use fully autonomous driving because I did it once and it hit the curb. <laughs> and the curb's only that high. Anyway, so it didn't see it. Any other yeah. here? So, so stress engineering is used uh, in semiconductor uh, devices to improve mobility and so on. Do you do any of these? I mean, trying to. Yeah, yeah, I, I apologize. So, that aluminum nitride actually strains the GAN because the band gap is pretty different. Go back to the band gap. Sorry. So yeah, so when I add aluminum to the gallium nitride, it's a pretty big different. Line. So we get a lot of strain. So just like they strain silicon, yeah, we strain the channel by adding the aluminum nitride on top. But you got to keep it thin because if you go, if you go just beyond the critical thickness, which is only one nanometer, then it cracks. So then you have to go back to algan pretty quick. But yeah, there's a lot of strain engineering, and that strain is very hard to control in epitaxy and. Uh, we don't have a good way to monitor it in situ. So all these measurements are, we have to do x-ray, uh, double crystal x-ray measurements on every crystal we grow. So that takes a student like another four hours. So they can grow the crystal, but then they spend a lot of time in the x-ray lab, AFM lab, before they even fabricate it. Any other questions? There are two things in the chat someone might be asking. Oh. Might just be goodbye. Might be. Oh, this battery thing. In theory, could there be any useful effects? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So they are doing density functional calculations on new doping atoms, particularly for diamond and uh, some of the others. You, you can use uh, DFT calculations. I've seen it's pretty good success. <laughs> 